Praise the Lord, Kingdom Fellowship. Let's give Jesus a great praise. If you know he's worthy, jump out of your seat and just wave those hands. Just begin to shout unto God with the voice of triumph. If you know he's worthy. Jesus, please have your way as we worship you, as we honor you, as we give you the glory. Amen.
Jesus, blessed Savior, he's worthy to be praised. Focus. Praise the Lord. And so good to see each and every one of you out for another Bible study. We are excited uh, to continue the conversation that we began this past Sunday uh, with our new series, Question Everything. We have the uh, Venerable Reverend Dr. Nicole Martin joining us. 
uh, to uh, continue the dialogue and the conversation. But before we jump in, before we get started, I just want to take a moment to encourage you to invite somebody else uh, to this uh, opportunity to delve into the word, to receive from God. And so if you don't mind, uh, would you go ahead if you're on Facebook and start a, a watch party? Uh, Put this up as a link uh, on your social media, text it out, tweet it, do whatever you have to do. Let somebody know the word of God is going forward right now uh, from Kingdom Fellowship. We're looking forward to what God is going to say and do uh, by his word and by his spirit. In fact, let's go ahead and invite the spirit of the Lord here uh, right now. Reverend uh, Martin, would you go ahead and uh, lead us in a word of prayer? Sure, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of this day. We thank you, God, for new mercies that met us this morning. We thank you for the grace of allowing us to be alive in this moment. And we pray right Amen. now that your word would become alive even as we study, even as we listen, even as we engage. Let your living word transform us, God, in ways that we desperately need. We pray that this time would draw us closer to you. And by your grace, Lord, allow this word, these seeds planted, to bring forth harvest on our lives, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. We thank you, we honor you, and we praise you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And uh, we're excited to uh, continue the dialogue. One of the things that uh, has become absolutely clear to me uh, is that this is a season where everybody has questions. The only people that don't have questions right along here are those who have problems with the truth, because honest people uh, can acknowledge the fact that we have questions about life, about God, about ourselves and what we're called to do during the season. And that's sort of the place that birthed my uh, inspiration uh, for the series, Question Everything. It's actually, uh, and I'll talk about this later on in the series, but it's a question, it's a phrase that uh, was actually made po popular by Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. uh, and then more recently, when I say recently, I mean within the last uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, one of the chief atheists uh, in the world, a uh, comedian by the name of George Carlin. And I think it's important for us to recognize that <clears throat> as scientists raise the, the issue of question everything, as atheists raise the question, the issue of question everything, interestingly, as believers, we are empowered with the right to question everything. And it's because we serve a God who asked many, many questions. And that was sort of the launching place for uh, the message that I tried to share this past Sunday, um, that in fact, Jesus raised many more questions than he asked. That Jesus asked, uh, mm -hmm. that Jesus asked 307 questions. He was asked 183 questions and he answered three questions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to the extent to which uh, we, often see Jesus as the answer rather than the question itself, I think that it says a lot to us about how we go through and we uh, understand life and who God is and who we are. In fact, that's sort of where I wanted to jump off today uh, and just raise this to you, uh, Dr. Martin. How does the idea that Jesus asked so many more questions than he answered affect your understanding of your faith? Mm. Well, first of all, I am super, super excited about this time. I remember on Sunday, my family and I were there, the whole family, girls included, wrote down our 307, 183, three, we have it listed. Um, and I remembered when I heard you say that, it just, it struck me that as Christians, we are often least likely to engage in conversations that would shake things up too much we are often least likely to be prepared for answers. So back when we were in seminary, it was apologetics was like this big deal and everybody had to go through apologetics. And the main reason was so that when the Jehovah's Witness came and knocked on your door, you would have something to say, or at least, you know, don't let them out talk you. Um, <laughs> but, but I think there somehow, I don't know if it's just because of fear or comfort. There's a point in our lives with Christ where we stop playing offense with God and asking him our questions and, and bringing our pain to him. And we start just accepting, well, that's just the way it is. And that becomes the answer to everything. Well, God said it, I believe it, that's it. And I think there's a point in our lives where we kind of turn off our intellect, we turn off our curiosity, and that actually can stifle our relationships with God. When, when hearing the fact that Jesus asked so many questions becomes an invitation to, to turn back on that faucet of curiosity and ask him, I mean, bring it out and have a conversation. Yeah, I think it's powerful. You make a great point because in actuality, it's not like we don't have them. The question is, do we own them? Mm 
do we acknowledge them? Are we willing to surface them, you know, to the savior? So, so, so give me a sense of some of the questions that you've been raising or that have been raised to you, Mm. uh, particularly during this season. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first question, I remember the first couple of weeks, somebody said to me, did God um, invent, design, create the coronavirus? Um, Why did God allow the coronavirus to happen? Why are so many good people dying? Um, One of the questions that I've always been asked in ministry, if I prayed for my loved one who died, why did God still take their lives? And you know, what frustrates me most is not the fact that we have the questions. I think that is a beautiful thing. What frustrates me is when we have pat answers to questions that really aren't there. It's the responses that, well, you know, God wanted your loved one more than you did. Or, you know, that's why your loved one died. Or it's, um, you know, well, maybe God allowed, I remember back with uh, Katrina, well, God allowed uh, Hurricane Katrina to happen because of all the voodoo. That, like, oh, if there's anything that like, burned me up, please don't give a response to something that God hasn't responded to in that way. Because then we send people off away from faith when when questions are designed to draw us in. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the challenge for us is to reckon maybe the reason that people don't ask these questions or are fearful to ask them or ask them amiss is because they don't have good tools yeah. to handle questions, right? right. And so uh, the word of God becomes our question book. Yes. And one of the things that God's word does is it validates our questions oftentimes by asking the same question. Isn't that true? That's right. Right. That that literally what I'm asking is not anti-faith. It's actually a part of the faith. And and that there are answers, but there also are clues and there also are paths. And there also um, is an invitation to relationship where one discovers Mm. uh, greater insight. Mm. And quite frankly, is sometimes the answer is not a um, a group of data points. Right. Sometimes the answer is relational strength mm. uh, mm-hmm. and the spirit of long suffering and yeah. the ability to endure. Yeah. Um, and so I think by by raising questions and by consulting God's word and by putting ourselves in position to learn by sitting under pastoral teaching Mm -hmm. uh, to be found as a part of the church where we're able to align our questions with the questions of others, uh, that there are any number of sources that inform our questions rather than us sort of taking this binary approach to questions as if God is Google and we're just supposed to, you know, (laughs) ask something and and get a a, a pat, as you said, as a pat answer. I tried to actually raise that point in the message that Google can tell you, but it can't teach you. Because in order to teach you, you have to be asked questions. When we went to school, we got questions. Yes, yes, that's right. I was, um, as you were talking, I was thinking about like, what were the first questions that rocked me for real? I think there is a perception, by the way, that because you're a pastor, because you know the word, you don't have any questions, or that you've never had a question that threw you off. Have you ever had questions or has there ever been a question for you that was like, oh my gosh, this is, this, this might change everything. Yeah. I think for me, um, my questions have come mostly, um, I think in the context of ministry, especially difficulty. Um, my first, the first time I had to do a eulogy was for, uh, a six year old child who was a twin who had passed of a brain aneurysm. And I was like, wow, like, no, you know, this is, this is what, and, and so all the questions that come to that, right. Not just death, but death Mm -hmm. of an innocent child. Right. And, uh, the difficulty of, of what that means for everybody. Um, so I think early on, I learned to own and to acknowledge my questions. And that's why I was so affirmed to figure out that actually God has no problem with them. Yeah. Um, and that it is through the process of questioning mm-hmm. that I have now sort of developed my own understanding of, of the Odyssey, uh, yeah. which is a fancy term for, you know, the existence of a good God in the midst of difficult uh, situations. Yeah. Um, 
and what you referred to earlier as apologetics, that I've mm-hmm. sort of had to build a framework for my own sanity, forget, yes. you know, the ability to minister to others, right. but so that it made sense to me. Yeah. And so um, uh, the, the whole rubric of, you know, sometimes it's not God, it's the devil. Sometimes it's not the devil, it's life. Sometimes it's not life, it's people making bad choices. Sometimes it's us making bad choices for ourselves. Sometimes it's evil operating through others. That there's this whole panoply of a rubric of, um, of actors within uh, the cosmic stage that cause negative results. Yeah. Rather than, again, the sort of elementary school Yes. You know, God is angry or God is happy. And therefore, yes. everything in my life is a reflection of God's anger or God's happiness, which is just not consistent with scripture. It's not consistent yes. with our faith. Um, and once we graduate to that, it does not uh, necessarily answer, again, all the questions in a neat package. But it does give us to know that there are a whole bunch more resources and that God is much more complex because life is much more complex. And it's in that complexity that we actually mature, develop and grow and actually become uh, more strengthened. Just as, mm-hmm. you know, when I was in first grade, it was one plus one equals two. Yeah. But, you know, by the time we got to, to high school, it was algebra, which yes. I didn't do very well. In. But it was a, <laughs> a, great, it was a, a, a more complex form of math that actually helped me to deal with more complex issues. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so let, let me, uh, let me jump in and just remind us of our primary text, uh, which came from uh, the gospel according to Luke. And in that text, you know, Jesus is asked this question by John the Baptist, are you the one uh, or should we look for another? And, and that was uh, a polemic. Uh, it was, it really was a critique. It wasn't just like, Hey, mm-hmm. you know, our, our, what, what's your identity? As I tried to establish, you already knew Jesus' identity better than anyone else. It really is, if you are who you say you are, yeah. then we need to see some evidence because right now, you know, you're, you're, you're seeming not to be who you said you were. And, and I think that is born out of John's personal crisis mm-hmm. um, and is also born out of his crisis of the pol- his understanding the political nature of Jesus. Mm-hmm. John the Baptist is in jail mm-hmm. for standing up for yes. the uh, biblical view of marriage, that yes. Herod has tried to yeah. marry his uh, brother's wife right. and is trying to redefine marriage because of his authority. Yeah. And John the Baptist has stood up against it based on the word. Mm-hmm. And he's been jailed. Interestingly, Herod actually didn't have a problem with the critique. It was actually Herod's wife who got upset right. and forced him to do it. But yeah. the, the point is, he finds himself in this situation and Jesus has not come to take, get him out of jail personally, nor has he like come to back him up politically. Mm-hmm. And that has caused him to become disillusioned. And yeah. I think that's where a lot of us become disillusioned in our faith when Jesus doesn't show up the way we want him to that's personally it. or politically. That's it. That's it. And I think for some reason, we have an expectation of how God is supposed to show up if he's real. Um, I'll never forget my first real big question. This is like, this was my real turning point as a freshman in college. I grew up in the church, you know, my dad's a pastor. um, And I kind of did the high school follow Jesus thing. I got to college and I was like, well, that didn't do me any good. So I was like, all right, Lord, you have uh, one week. I literally gave the Lord one week. I remember it was my freshman year. It was February and I did everything that I was supposed to do. I read the Bible. I fasted. I had never fasted before. I didn't even like brush my teeth, which I don't recommend on fasting. It's just a terrible, terrible thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I went to the Bible study on the hallway. The girls would always invite me to the Bible study. I would never go. Decided to go. The end of that night, I was like, nothing. No angels, no many, many, you know, there's no writing on the wall. I saw, I felt nothing. I felt no feeling. And I was like, peace out, God. I literally made a decision that I was done. I said, I've done everything you've asked me to do and nothing special has happened to me. So I'm done with the faith. Mm -hmm. And later that week, I was invited to gospel choir. I was like, nope, I am no longer a Christian. I'm done with that. And they begged and begged and my people pleaser kind of, chipped in. I was like, fine. I sat in the back of Benton Chapel on the campus of Vanderbilt and they were having this very charismatic gospel choir rehearsal. And the, um, the director of the gospel choir turns to the back and says, you, God wants you to pray. I said, no. (laughs) And then he turns to the choir and says, everyone pray. And he turned back and said, you, God wants you to pray. I was like, oh Lord. So I remember slowly making my way to the front 
And I cannot tell you that there were any bells or whistles. I cannot tell you that God showed up as I wanted to show up. All I can tell you is I opened my mouth and words came out. And I knew in that moment that there was still a reason to believe. And I think part of our challenge is our, we have these high expectations that God would do big and miraculous things. And when God does simple things like keeping you alive, opening your mouth so you can pray, then, then those, we have to understand how God is nuanced in the mundane things. And maybe that too is an answer in some way to prayer. I have no idea why I told you that story. I hope that, <laughs> I feel like that was like, <laughs> No, that's, that's good stuff. I, I, well, I think one of the things it illustrates is how again, people have an expectation, especially yes. of pastors and preachers, of how God speaks to us. And I, yes. I actually opened up a sermon talking about I've really only heard God speak that I know four or five times in my life. Yes. Um, I preach every Sunday, so that yeah. should be troubling to the congregation, except <laughs> for the fact that God speaks through his word and God speaks yes. through study. God speaks. Right. And so, but when I hear like, you know, the ah, voice yeah. of God, yeah. that's not that often. Yeah, I heard it when he told me to, to accept his call to ministry. Yes. Obviously, accept my call to salvation, yes. call to ministry to marry mm-hmm. Shauna. Yes. You know, yep. and probably something else, right? Yep. But not yep. a lot more than that. Yep. Um, and I, it reminds me of, you know, when Naaman goes looking for his miracle. Yeah. And the prophet tells him, hey, go jump in the Jordan seven times, you'll be cleansed. And he's like, I'm going back home. Don't you exactly know why right. I am? I'm expecting you to wave your hands like they do yes. on TV. And I'll so yes. I brought my <laughs> offering with me. And when it doesn't happen, he's ready to go back home. And his servant's like, listen, if he asked you to do something difficult, you'd have done that. So yes. if he asked you to do something simple, why not just do that? So why like, do that? have faith in God. Seems so simple. Yes. Why don't you try it, right? Oh. Um, and so to the extent to which I think we allow sometimes Hollywood to shape our understanding yeah. of God more than scripture, yeah. uh, we come into difficulty. And it's not to say that God does not do great right. miracles. I can right. tell you right now. One of the greatest miracles I've ever seen in my entire life, right? Yeah. It's happening right now. Yeah. Church after church I'm talking to is like so strong right now. Wow. Their giving is up. Their people are excited. Mm-hmm. They're they're engaged. Yeah. Their their prayer uh, ministries are going off the chain. Yeah. I'm talking, and we're talking like, yeah, I've never seen such a large scale revival yes. within yes. the church, north, south, yes. east, west, black, white yes. denominations, whatever. It's happening all over. Yeah. That's a huge global miracle, yes, right? Absolutely. But we're not going to, it's like God's not going to get credit for that because COVID's still here. Well, mm. COVID's a plague. And if you look in human history, plagues always exist. Yes. So right. so you can't take life away from life and, and then expect that, you know, and then try to equate that with God's presence or God's power. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so let me, let me ask, uh, how have, um, what, what kinds of questions um, ha, let me ask it this way. Have you asked the kinds of questions to Jesus in this season of crisis mm-hmm. that are unique to this crisis? Or have you heard mm-hmm. persons mm-hmm. raise those kind of questions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, one of the most common questions is, did God cause COVID? Mm-hmm. And then the second question with that is, did God want those people to die, the hundreds of thousands who've lost their lives. And then I think there are secondary questions to that. Um, Why is it that the health disparities are the way that they are? Why is it that it's always black and and brown families who suffer the most in times of crisis? Mm -hmm. And, you know, interestingly enough, I was on an interfaith panel discussion last night and I heard a Jewish woman talk about the, the tendencies of God throughout the Old Testament. Well, I mean, she didn't say the Old Testament. It was the Holy Scriptures. Sure. Um, and she talked about how um, in the in the first five books that plagues were sent as judgment, that God, you know, uh, sends the death angel and spares the Israelites. And then she said, and then God takes a shift. And all of a sudden, the plague or the danger is not sent in judgment. God establishes a new rhythm that when death comes, it comes for all. And when the plague comes, it comes for all. And that there is no distinction between the righteous 
righteous and the unrighteous. Mm -hmm. And she was saying like this, this understanding that um, God sends thing kind of, kind of ends at a certain point in scripture. And the other understanding is that God allows things. She talked about Job and she talks about, you know, how God permits things, but that the richness of God, and this is a Jewish woman, the richness of God is in the invitation of free will, that when God invites free will into the land, then we are now um, both, we're both, um, the righteous and the unrighteous are subject to the dangerous things that happen by the hands of man, to mm -hmm. the calamities that happen by way of life. And just listening to her reminded me of exactly what you said, that there's something about the Christian life where we think everything belongs to God, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But then other faiths think about this as, well, part of this is human. Part of this is, you know, the attack of the enemy. Um, so I think that was the question that I've heard most often. Did God allow COVID? And, and as we search for answers, I think scripture makes it clear that God allows certain calamities, God allows free will, but God doesn't sit in his throne and say, and now COVID come here, it's time for you to be sent down and take those lives. Mm -hmm. um, and the question for us is how do we reckon with this overwhelming love of God in the midst of things that pierce us, that, that make us, cause us pain, that, that cause us hurt? How can I say, God loves me deeply and also know that God allowed my loved one to die. Yeah. That's where it's hard. If you love me, then why do you hurt me or allow pain to come to me? Mm -hmm. And I think if you dig beneath the COVID question, you'll find that question at the core. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and that, the, that the response, and I think response oftentimes may be a better frame than answer. Yes, yeah, than uh, answer. Is... Is what we see. So, 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 so Jesus teaches us to pray, Abba, you yes. know, our Father. Yes. And the whole concept of parenthood. Yes. Is that the parent is the one that gives comfort to the child mm -hmm. when the child cannot make sense mm -hmm. of what's happening. Yeah. When the child is hurt, mm -hmm. even if the parent, quote unquote, is the source of the pain. Yeah. Right? So, uh, when we've had the discipline alley, mm -hmm. she's cried. Mm -hmm. And when she's cried and become upset, she fell into our arms, even though we were the source of the discipline, mm -hmm. right? And so even if God does not send or source yeah. the pain, yeah. whatever he allows still, he's there to comfort and keep us, yes. and he's us to help us get through. Yes. And so um, when, when she's hurt her knee, mm -hmm. my hug does not stop the pain right. from hurting, right. but it does give her strength for her to handle the pain. Yes, yes. And, and that's why scripture is so significant because yes. it takes us out of our problem solving frame and yeah. it shows us the kingdom way yeah. of dealing with difficulty. Yes. And, and that's why I think Jesus is so careful to raise crucial questions. I wanted to raise yeah. a couple, just two tonight, Matthew's gospel, sixth chapter, mm. the 25th verse. Uh, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or mm. about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away yes. in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? So again, as is his custom, Jesus launches into this, not one question, but these <laughs> series of questions. Yes. Right? And he's sort of taking you down this path, this logical path, this theological path, to show you sort of sort of why worry is not a valuable problem solving approach, That's right? right. Yep. Um, that you're more valuable yep. than these random things, and that that worrying itself does not seem to be impactful because mm -hmm. if you spend an hour worrying, it won't add one minute to your life. So, so, so I think for us, especially during the season. The whole concept of worry and anxiety when every time you air little every time you turn on the television literally it's waiting for you yes yeah man i 
I love the way that Jesus frames this because I, I always find in the midst of a question that Jesus asks, there's a core value there that he wants us to latch on to. And when I hear and when I read this, this series of questions around worry, I hear this resounding word like value, that you have value and that this doesn't add value. Worrying doesn't add more value to you. You don't become a, a brilliant problem solver because you've worried about it for 15 hours. The, the core of this is your life has value. And are you not more valuable than the birds that I take care of? So it just, it, it, Jesus has a way of asking a question that makes you break down. When I worry at the core, could it be that I question my own value? Could it be at the core, I question whether or not my life is worth it? I wonder, you know, when I hear Jesus's questions, it almost stirs up more questions in me. Like, has my worrying been a result of me trying to be God? Has my worrying been a result of me questioning my own purpose? Deep down, am I most concerned about the things or am I most concerned about my own value, my worth, and whether or not I matter to God or matter to other people? And I just love the way that his questions invite us to ask more questions and that beneath each question, he's got like an affirmation. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I got you. So, you know, not just don't worry, but you have value. You have meaning. Your life means something to me. Yeah. And, I, and it's so important because that value is not based on any extrinsic yes. uh, factor. So it's that I'm valuable because of my position. I'm valuable right. because I'm a parent or a child. I'm not valuable because of the wealth that I've been able to create or popularity or how many followers I have on social media, mm. that the value is based in my core identity. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that he, to some extent, I'm also equated with those things, right? Yeah. So I'm also equated with the birds of the air, right? Yeah. And that they are part of God's creation as am I. Mm -hmm. And as he takes care of them, so I am sure that he will take care of me. Yes. Yeah. And that's actually really powerful because, you know, in the creation story, yeah. we see that, that humanity is given um, agency over all the other creation, right? That we're to, to dem have dominion. Mm. But in this particular instance, we're saying, hey, listen, at the end of the day, our, we have unity of creation yeah. while we still maintain our supremacy over creation, yeah. but the unity allows us to know that as long as we're seeing birds around yes, and flowers around, yes. we're going to be around. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that the same level of care that God takes for the things that we don't worry about, mm. the same level of care that he gives us. So the, the irony of Jesus questions is that there, there's a response. I like the word response over answer. There's a response to the question almost embedded within the question. So studying the 307 actually gives us a series of responses, many of which I think are pretty much the same. Like there's this kind of consistent, like, I got this and I got you. <laughs> and one doesn't think that birds of the air are sitting around worrying. Right. No flowers, right? Yes. This sort of being and their being is sufficient. And that this is probably how you ought to actually consider you know, yep. a, a path forward in your life. So let me get, let's, let's deal with one more. Mm -hmm. Matthew, the 12th chapter and the 46th verse, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Mm. Yeah, it's just how we, we call it frame breaking, that Jesus literally yes. takes the frame of our understanding and says, boom, all right, now let me yes. just give you a whole new way to yes. look at this. I mean, this, this is what he does, you know, and throughout the Sermon on the Mount, where mm -hmm. he's like, you've heard it said, but yep. boom, let me show you what yes. I'm saying. That's good. That's good. And that's what happens when he raises those questions, you know. Who are my mother? Who are my yes. brothers? Yes. How, how does that help you particularly uh, throughout the season as yes. family is being mm -hmm. so redefined by the fiscal circumstances of quarantine 
and also church is being redefined because of our physical restriction of not being able to gather together. How do we re-understand family? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it is important to say that sometimes Jesus just comes off like <laughs> just a tiny bit mean. I don't know if mean is the word, but I, I when I've I heard, go I gangster. Read, <laughs> gangster <laughs> I mean like it's like this one it's the Syrophoenician woman we're like really Jesus it's the whole well unless you drink my blood and eat my body you give me like exactly right. there, there are there are certain questions that make you my instinct my human nature is like did you have to say it that way did you have to question it that way I mean they were standing outside and you do have an obligation to your family <laughs> But, but in this particular question, uh, this reframing kind of reorients the priorities of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think the while it might feel strange that he would say that those born in my family, my blood family, that they have us, they can wait, basically. I do sense that Jesus is opening the door for those of us who would read and engage in his word, where he's saying, let's reorder our priorities. That priority here is, is those who have relationship with me. And priority here is established by a sense of family that is established by faith and not just by blood. And as we wrestle through family and as we wrestle through priorities and as we wrestle through the many hats that we wear, I feel great comfort in knowing that Jesus is willing to reprioritize according to his faith. Mm -hmm. um, and I also feel great comfort in knowing that he did eventually go to his mother and his brothers. Mm -hmm. It's not like he didn't care. It's just that in this teachable moment, he was reminding us that there, there is a certain prioritization that comes when you become a child of God. That when I say yes to Christ, when I become part of this family, there's a reprioritization that should take place in my life. That those who are closest to me should be those who I know um, share a relationship with Christ with me. That those that I allow in an inner circle should be those that I know will lift me, who will buoy me to Christ when I can't seem to get there myself. And there's a breath in that reprioritization. So in this season, when I'm, you know, working and, and Mark's working and the kids are, you know, trying to homeschool and all these things are happening, it's like Christ gives me the grace to say, A, set the priority for today. That it's okay that today's priority may be different from tomorrow. And B, set the priority according to your faith, according to the leading of the Lord. That the leading of the Lord says, today, I, I'm going to be a rock star mom and I'm going to forget some of the things at work. Mm -hmm. In this moment today, I need to be present at work and the kids are going to be all right on Kindle. <laughs> you know, um, and, and being able to have that flexibility of priority, I think all of that comes from that question. Because Jesus is like, what's important right now? And then he tends to what is important right now. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, you know, your original point about how Jesus is gangster and Jesus is yes. insensitive in the 2020, you know, yeah. notion of sensitivity, right? Yeah, yeah that's that, right. You know, that's right. Our emotional awareness and emotional, yes. emotional sensitivity and political yeah. correctness is not consistent with the perspective of scripture. I mean, Jesus just says some harsh stuff. Like whoever, you know, does not hate mother and father, sister, brothers, not one of you. So let me get this straight. Yes. You want right? me to hate. And, and so, you know, I think it's important for us to be able to step outside yes. of our culture, of our perspective, yes. of our norms, mm -hmm. and to get a king. That's why we talk about kingdom focus all the time, because it's really about seeing life through the eyes of God yep. and seeing the kingdom, the benefit of the kingdom perspective in every situation. Yes. So whether it's prioritizing my time, and which yep. thing is really most important here, mm -hmm. or being able to speak difficult truths, yes. recognizing that good meat makes its own gravy. And if it is the word of God and God is mm -hmm. using you as a vessel, mm -hmm. then even if it doesn't happen in that instant, it will bear itself to be true That's over right. time. I think quite frankly, one of the reasons that the church is experiencing such revival is that it's being shown to be right. Yes. That for the last, you know, several decades, you know, the world and its inventions and its conventions yeah. have created an entire, you know, sort of mythological 
um, reality that people have bought into. Mm. And now it's being shown to be, you know, weighed and measured and found wanting. Yeah. And folks like, you know what, that whole life is about more than likes and yes. up in my garage. Yes. There may be something to that. We There's may need to go that. back and, and consider that. And so I think, you know, for us as the church, it's important that we are ready to receive mm. uh, with good responses, yeah. um, you know, to, to where, where people are. Yeah. But I think that it, it has to start with, again, what you're talking about, speaking mm. the difficult truths yeah. um, so that people can learn the difficult lessons. Um, I said on Sunday, you know, it, how come people with all the answers keep failing all the tests? Like, yes, if, if yes. you know so much, how come it's not working? Yeah, and I don't know about you, but I have several people in my life who have so much to say yes. and no fruit to show. Yes, from. exactly right. You know, like yes. so, so, so your perspective is great. This is your fifth marriage. Help me understand again <laughs> why I should be sitting here. Right, you right. know. You are yeah. still renting at 68. You've never owned a square inch of property, but please advise me more about how to govern my finances. Yeah, and no one yeah. seems to ask those questions, right? We just seem to sort of let people, especially on the internet, just sort of get up and, hey, I'm teaching a master class. I'm like, but you're teaching it from nowhere. Like you've achieved nothing, you've accomplished nothing. And I'm not even talking about credentials. I mean, yeah. you're, you're the sum total of your life's work yes. is this post. Yes, and yes, because yes. you've been able to post it, I should sit and consider it. And so I think that Jesus is reframing to yes. say, hey, listen, family is uh, a convention of the kingdom mm. and mm. it's faith first and it's defined by faith. And to the extent to which you recognize faith has been as being the central frame through which you are to understand life, everything else then gets filled in. Yes. So, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his yes. righteousness, all this other thing will be added unto you. Yes. It's the prioritization that makes sense. It's right. putting things in the proper order that's so right. your life is not out of order. Yes. And, and I think that's what we're seeing through this season for those who are being faithful and, and open to the spirit, mm. that God will use this season of crisis to reprioritize yes. and reorder our lives in a way yes. that's more consistent with this kingdom. You, you raised one more thing. I wanted to jump back mm. to it. You raised the question of, you know, how come it's always us? Like we were, yeah. we're dying the most out of COVID. We're yep. dying from the police. We're dying from yeah. black on black crime. Mm -hmm. like how come it's always mm -hmm. us? And again, scripture is yelling and saying, hey, so, you know, Jesus came to minister to an oppressed people. Yes. They were under, you know, Roman oppression. They were an mm -hmm. occupied people. Right. He came, he lived, he ministered, he was yes. crucified. On the third day, he was raised. Yes. And even after he was raised, they were still an, an occupied people. Yes. And that throughout his ministry, people kept trying to reframe him as the king that would topple this king. And that yes. he was the political leader that was going topple this political system. And of course, it's not so that Jesus doesn't have anything to say about government and fair play, but it is to say that we cannot just use him as a means to our end. So right. Jesus is not just here to pay my bills, to fix no. you know my health, yes. to fix the governmental system, yes. because at that point we've made him our cosmic bellhop. Yes. And he's saying, listen, you know, as long as humans are in control of anything, you can trust there's going to be oppression and discrimination yep. Yep. and all these things. So whether you call it capitalism or socialism or any other ism, mm -hmm. it's going to be oppressionism yes. because man is corrupt. And until yep. your soul gets right and until you see, and we see what the, the world should look like mm -hmm. through acts and what the, the church look like and everyone held all things in common. Mm -hmm. There is an image for what is right versus just a critique of what is wrong. That's right. I think that really, especially as we see the co-opting of the religious left and the religious right, yes. it's really important for us to be able to speak kingdom and biblical truth into that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and I know the circles that you travel in, you are caught in those conversations a lot. What's, what's that been like? All the time. I, I am convinced that one of the worst things that happened for this rise of evangelicalism, and I put that in quotes because I know there's a very broad term of that. So let's just say a rise of fundamentalism where everything is black and white mm -hmm. is we've lost the mystery of God. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And the moment we think we have God figured out, that's the moment we think we can condemn and declare and say all kinds of things. I mean, one of the things that has come up in some conversations is, you know, you have some um, white Christians who are saying, well, I, I agree with you. I hear you, but you cannot go the critical race theory route. Well, critical race theory says that there is that white supremacy and white privilege puts white people in a constant state of having to be aware and having to be, you know, um, conscious and having to let go. And so they say, well, that's not Christian because, you know, if I'm forgiven, then I'm forgiven. Well, technically, there's a perpetual nature to our salvation. There's a constant sanctification that happens. And I never go to God and say, I confess my sins, I'm done. I actually need to confess on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So let's like, let's stop trying to make everything black and white. I said, I'm sorry, I'm done. I hear you. And this whole series about questions invites us into a place of mystery, which can actually help us in our race relationships. Mm -hmm. If I think I understand the Hispanic community, because I have one Hispanic friend, I miss it all together. If I think I understand all white people, because I have one white friend, I miss it all together. So an invitation to mystery and acceptance that I don't know everything says, I may know one person, but I don't know all. I might know one element of the system, but I don't know all. And my humility, my posture in this season should be, teach me. Help me to know, tell me your story, let me understand. And the grace of the gospel says, I need three answers (laughs) that Jesus gave those three. Those are the three answers I need. And if he is with me, then I can have a posture of listening and I won't have to be unduly guilty, but I can actually hear and repent as necessary and continue on the journey with you. Yeah, that's awesome. And and it reminds me, I want to ask you to to open the door for salvation in the church in a minute and pray for us. But before we do, it it reminded, what you said reminded me of the sort of easy answer that that some fundamentals want to give now. Like, we're forgiven, let's move on. Yeah. Which over, which which ignores the biblical model. So Zacchaeus says, listen, I'm going to give half of what I have to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'm going to give them four times, right? Because I recognize that I've done a wrong. And therefore, while I am forgiven, I'm receiving salvation, new life. That requires me to provide reparation. It requires me to tangibly not only give up what I've done, but also pay back and pay forward for what I've done to those to whom I've done harm. And I think that to challenge, and again, to bring those conversations back to the word. Yeah. Say, okay, so what we're going to do is Zacchaeus, yeah. right? Because right. he provides a model for us of what, right. you know, uh, reconciliation looks like, particularly yes. as it relates to privilege and prosperity yes. and power. Yes. That's that right. It's not just, okay, I, I'm not going to do it anymore, but I'm going to pay back those to whom I've done it before. And so, and so, and so scripture provides us the, the, the guide forward and Jesus is the answer. Jesus yes. is the question, and the Jesus question. is the way. Uh, would you open? Would you open the, the door and extend the invitation? Sure. We are so so blessed that you've tuned in with us. And if you're listening and you've been wondering your own questions, does God exist? Is Christ real? Is this life really worth it? We want to invite you into a relationship with God, a relationship that will both change your questions and give you responses that will help you through life. And I can't tell you that having faith makes everything perfect. In fact, having faith might complicate things a little bit, but the assurance of the presence of God, the assurance of the forgiveness of your sins, the assurance of knowing that when all this passes away, we will go to be with God forever is the assurance that you might need right now. So if you're listening, we invite you to make that confession of faith. And that confession is simple. I believe that Jesus is Lord. We say this with our mouths. We believe in our hearts that Christ rose Jesus from the dead. And by that conviction, we are saved. So if you're listening, we invite you to reach out to us, to reach out to our church kingdom fellowship ame church we would love to journey with you on this process of salvation once you are saved you are saved but this process of sanctification is real Mm -hmm. and we want to be your journey partners and 
I know Pastor Watley would love to be your pastor as you come and journey with us. And also, if you're listening and you need a church home, we encourage you to join this church. You can join virtually. It doesn't matter where you live. You can be become part of this community and grow with us as we are seeking to grow with God. Amen. Pastor Watley. So, so we encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. The Bible says the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. So please don't let this moment pass you by. God brought you here and allowed all the circumstances of your life to transpire as they had to bring you to this moment of change and the turning and transformation. So please take advantage of someone who's going to reach out to you uh, if you just take the words there on the screen. Finally, uh, before we pray, we do want to encourage you to sow and to sacrifice in a good soil. Uh, you can use one of the electronic means that are giving. I, I got a note from one of our officers said, hey, uh, Pastor, for the last couple of Bible studies, you've not allowed people the opportunity to give. And so I want to apologize for that because you know, there's a blessing in giving. And so uh, we want to encourage you to sow into what you know is good soil that we might continue the work of ministry here. Uh, we want to thank you for your support. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we glorify you. We praise you uh, for the richness of relationship that brings sense out of the nonsense of what we're dealing with in this life. We pray now, God, that you might give us faith sufficient to ask difficult questions, but then to hang around yes. so that we might receive your response. Yes. Help us, God, to be fair with you Mm. So that we do not try to limit you to our own understanding, the way the world thinks, mm. uh, to receive your response. But God, help us to give you a blank slate and a blank check mm. to respond the way that you will to lead us to a new level of living and understanding mm. the kingdom. We thank you for the richness and the treasure of your word and for allow, mm. allowing us to dialogue together around it. Now, as we prepare to move forward by faith, we pray that your angels will guard us and guide us, keep us fast and hold us safe. We bless you, we trust you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. amen. Hey, there the girls are. Hey, they were like sweet. sitting on the side, like, can I come bless in now? <laughs> Wonderful. We'll look to see you on Sunday, all right? You yes. all take care. Bless you. All right.